what we're trying to do is get member states of the African Union to have a collective voice when they are then negotiating at the UN, at the IMF, at the World Bank and other IFIs um, and to have a collective position that speaks to the continent and then and speaks for the continent and, and benefits the continent. So my name is Jason Rosario Braganza and I'm the Executive Director at the African Forum and Network on Debt and Development. Uh, so we are a Pan-African civil society organization established in 1996 to advocate from a Pan-African perspective on public debt matters. Welcome to this podcast produced by the International Monetary Fund. I'm Bruce Edwards. Earlier this month, the IMF and the European Commission hosted the annual African Fiscal Forum, where finance ministers, heads of international agencies and development partners discussed ways to support the economies of sub-Saharan Africa as they navigate their way through the economic turmoil caused by the pandemic. AfroDad's Jason Braganza was invited to talk about growing debt in the region and what countries need to help them manage it. Um, I am a Kenyan, uh, born and raised in Nairobi. I have worked both in the UK for the UK's Department for International Development, here in Kenya for the Ministry of the East African Community Affairs, and um, soon after that uh, found my calling in uh, civil society advocacy and activism, and, and this has taken me to South Sudan, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, in Eastern Africa, Somaliland, and then further afield into Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, and then down south to South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Wow, that's impressive. Thanks so much for that. So, so I'd like to start by, by asking you uh, about your own personal experience as an economist working in Sub-Saharan Africa and some of the challenges that, that you've seen countries struggling with, you know, in terms of keeping their economies on track. Sure. I mean... Th- there's so many and you know, they, they combine differently to pr- uh, present different types of challenges, particularly when you're, you're looking at um, trying to achieve uh, different development objectives and growth objectives that are sort of agreed at global level and then sort of miraculously expected to translate at the national level when your resource base is extremely narrow. Um, and, and I think one of the commonalities across the continent has been exactly this narrow economic base, which then in turn has translated into a very narrow tax revenue base or a, a revenue mobilization base. Um, we've got a lot of focus on primary commodities, which are, you know, whilst very valuable to, to the global economic system or global commerce, very little value addition um, that is taking place on the continent. So we, we are still very much export dependent on very basic commodities. And this means low value, low tax revenue collection. The, the second one is, you know, understanding how the, the global architecture functions and, and the degree to which the region is actually a player that is influencing how the global architecture works, as opposed to just following the rules that are being made by, by its, its global trading partners or commerce economic partners. Third is, you know, we've got serious issues and challenges around systems capacity in terms of uh, the technical capacity of the the public sector to effectively work and and provide the the technical advice and support to policymakers to politicians to make right decisions and on many occasions you find that there is a a dependency or a reliance on external technical support to to negotiate or to advise on very critical matters and of course uh lastly there's you know a big issue of um you know the the politics you you can't separate politics from economic development or economic growth and politics of the day is usually what dominates um in our region if you look you know here in kenya or in in across the lake in uganda or down across kilimanjaro in tanzania or up in south sudan the role of politics cannot be ignored even in ethiopia so, you know, political challenges, political will to advance a, a certain type of transformative agenda and a transformative economic development uh, model is, is another challenge that, you know, I've witnessed over, over the several years uh, working in the region and also being from the region. Um, and I'm hesitant 
here um, you'll notice to use the word political instability. Um, I think that's an easy out to, to call out the region or, or the continent, but it's not really political instability. It's more the, the ability of the political class or the political strata of society to really think through what structural transformation and what development for people looks like. Um, we're still very much um, ingrained with the colonial or neo-colonial mantra of self-enrichment and supporting um, our own in, in terms of our little cocoons. So there's a lot of, you know, cronyism that, that goes on within the political class that, that undermines the ability to um, progress and, and, and achieve this truly structural transformative agenda that is very much possible uh, using the words of, you know, Kristalina, uh, the, the continent of possibilities, um, you know, very much possible. Yeah, and I think you've done just a great job there at laying out some of the problems or some of the issues that, that are holding uh, Sub-Saharan Africa back. But 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 one of the things that, that uh, does come up, uh, you know, a perennial problem for, for many countries in the region has been the issue of, of debt. Uh, how significant do you think this issue is of rising debt for Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment? It's quite significant. If you look at, you know, the Jubilee campaign from the early 2000s, you know, uh, out of, I think, the 47 countries that were beneficiaries of HIPIC and MDRI, I believe 34 were from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it just goes to show how systemic the, the debt crisis was then. And sadly, and, and very alarmingly, in the current debt crisis that we're facing that has been accelerated by the pandemic, a similar number of countries are facing, you know, very big debt challenges. But, but this crisis is, is, this debt crisis is a very different one in the sense that the, the development agenda has worked in a sense where several countries have reach this graduation point from being almost low income to low middle income um, in, in one way or another. And also the global financial markets has, has recognized this. And therefore the access to credit um, that has been made available to several African countries has increased. So I think this proliferation to non-concessional borrowing and non-concessional credit has been quite a significant contributor to the current crisis. Um, I think it was inevitable we were going to find ourselves in this situation. I think, you know, the, the region was already beginning to see um, a crisis on, on the horizon. It's just that, you know, the pandemic has accelerated that quite significantly. Um, the third factor I would say is the composition of financing for development that has been made available from our traditional development partners has also changed. And by this, I mean, when you look at the composition of ODA from bilateral countries or the international financial institutions, increasingly, I think the latest OECD figures seem to suggest increasingly that they are made up a lot more of loans rather than grants or concessional lending. So a bigger component is now featured is in the form of loans. And, and this in itself, I think, has been a, a significant contributor to then giving confidence to many African countries to then borrow on, on the global markets because they use that as leverage. So it, it is it is a big problem. Um, and we are, you know, beginning to see with the latest initiatives, the debt service suspension initiative, the common framework on treatment of debt. Uh, we've got, I think, three or four countries that have lined up to benefit from the, the G20's proposal. We've got, I think, six or seven African countries that have benefited from the Paris Club already. So, um, so it is a big problem. And I think, you know, we, we are beginning to, to see this unravel in, in, in ways that are quite unimaginable in terms of the medium to long term impact it's going to have. And as you point out, uh, a lot of the debt is a result of loans and investments from the private sector. How likely is it, do you think, that the private sector will actually buy into some form of debt relief or, or debt forgiveness? Uh, I, I mean, how do you get the private sector involved in this process, which in fact is, is a requirement uh, within the G20's debt restructuring framework? I think the biggest way is to 
understand how we can convince them that any type of debt relief or debt reprofiling um, is not going to hurt their returns. Um, it's, it's, it's very important to acknowledge that, you know, they, they've invested with the, with the ambitions of getting a return on their investment. Um, I think what is dangerous, however, and, and, and this is the situation we are finding ourselves in is the role of the credit rating agencies in propping up the private creditors in holding steadfast and not joining the table to negotiate. You know, credit rating agencies are threatening or ha- do have a very credible threat in terms of downgrading many African countries and hence why the uptake to a lot of these initiatives has been very slow. And and this has created jitters for the private sector. So I think there's an equation here with regard to how global finance and the global financial architecture and the global debt architecture needs to readjust its, its, its behavior, readjust its expectations and understand that there needs to be a solution that benefits both creditor and, and debtor country, that entire ecosystem and that relationship. Um, And I think one of the ways of doing this is is to really to get the credit rating agencies to minimize their their threat, to reduce the the rhetoric quite significantly and downplay the relative importance. Um, and, And I emphasize this because you know many African countries have publicly come out and said the reason they're not signing up to these initiatives is because they are they fear their credit rating is going to be affected. This will affect then their ability to, in the future, to borrow from the private market. And and this then also has a knock-on effect on getting the private creditors to the table because they don't want to then negotiate with the prospect of future losses uh, being accrued to them. And so, you know, the political dynamics there is really one where we need to start, um, and we have been doing this, is really say that you know private creditors are also part of this equation um you know they're they're part of the problem but they they are definitely also part of the solution in actually getting us uh, to move into into a place where um the debt relief debt restructuring and you know potentially debt cancellation in the future can actually happen Hmm. And do you see, uh, you know, the ideas that institutions on the continent have about how to deal with uh, the debt issue, for example, is uh, in line with, with what they're seeing the international community working on? Uh, like, do, do you think that the approach taken by the international community generally is the right one? Do institutions on the continent uh, agree with how they're, they're trying to deal with this issue? I think there's two ways of looking at this. So there is a a point where, you know, the, the pandemic has called for global partnership and 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 global um, synchronicity in terms of how the pandemic is dealt with. Whether it's you know in terms of curbing the spread, whether it's vaccination development or distribution and 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 vaccination programs, or even dealing with the economic and and social fallout. I think that it has called for some level of global harmony in that sense. Um, the extent to which the African IFIs agree with that, I think, would be um, a slightly different question. I think that you know politically you you need to be seen to be uh being part of of this global solution mm-hmm. um but at the same time i think it it's not lost on on african ifis that they needs to be homegrown solutions as well because our context from the starting point of this pandemic is very different yeah. the the base that of of which we were starting off you know, in January last year, is extremely different to where the US was or where Germany was or the UK was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I think there is there are these um, very finer details that the African IFIs are, are looking into in terms of the solutions coming out of this. And this is where I think AFRODAD and other Pan-African civil society organizations are looking to to be part of that political process, part of that technical process that prefers an, an alternative solution, a, a truly African solution that brings us out of this and, and one that is aligned to, for example, Agenda 2063, um, but also, you know, that embodies the Pan-Africanism that, that has been in, in some way um, been lost over the past couple of decades as we've, you know, implemented very pro-neoliberal policies and programs that, you know, really haven't provided the rewards that they promised. Yeah. You know, and so I think there is there is 
that opportunity that this crisis is presenting us with um, and one that we need to look at um, very carefully and, 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 and advance. Mm. So, so with all the, the talk about the, the different uh, approaches to, to debt relief, um, you know, there, there, there's so many varying opinions on that. But, but, but one thing it seems that everyone would agree on is the need to first uh, get people vaccinated and, and, and put the pandemic behind us. Do you worry that the current debt levels uh, might actually be hindering that, that process of getting people vaccinated? Oh yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I I had the the pleasure of listening to a panel that was that included the the IMF's managing director, mm-hmm. and she said, you know, the most important economic policy for the continent was its vaccination policy. Yeah. Um, and whilst I found that very profound in two ways, one is that you know there's an absolute truth in this, but on the other hand, there's you know what I'm sort of seeing in my observations that there's a true vaccination inequality that has emerged uh, as as once the vaccines had been discovered and uh, developed and, and seen to be working. Yeah. Um, you look at, you know, some countries in, in Europe and, and North America, you know, have procured or are planning to procure vaccine numbers that are four times their population yeah. um, or can vaccinate their population four times over. Now, when you look at that and you look at what the kind of numbers that are being provided in Africa through the COVAX program and also through the African Union's program, it's, it's a, it's a microcosm. And, and you start to ask yourself, well, how exactly then are we going to deal with this? Because, you know, even though the, the vaccines are available, there's a huge purchasing power inequality that, that exists and is being made worse by the debt crisis because, you know, countries in Africa are having to balance keeping their economies afloat. Um, keeping citizens um, healthy and, and businesses running, whilst at the same time having to pay off uh, and, and service their debts. Yeah. And, and, and the debt servicing pressures that are being placed on African governments right now is quite immense in, in that way. And, and, and that is why for a lot of us on the continent, what we're asking for is to, the creation of fiscal space to, to provide the social protection programs, to provide the, the stimulus for businesses, but also to create resources uh, for, for the vaccination procurement and the vaccination um, rollout programs. And then we can start thinking about the other uh, variables associated with the debt relief programs that, that, that can accrue to countries. So with all this rising debt and, uh, you know, the, the economic impact of this pandemic, uh, there is also a pretty dramatic human toll that the pandemic is taking on the continent, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, we are running the risk of making this debt crisis very much a heavy technical economic conversation, which rightly so it is. But that notwithstanding, it's important to realize that the crisis is having an impact on people. And across the continent, it's affecting people in in different ways. Um, Different segments of society, of the population are beginning and will continue to feel um, the very deep impacts of of this crisis. The estimates, I think, coming out of the World Bank um, on the poverty numbers is that extreme poverty on the continent is expected to increase by 2.5%. We are expected to, I think, the in the in the fiscal forum, the estimated uh, loss to the continent through education is being estimated at around five hundred billion U.S. dollars. Um, and of course, most importantly, and and I can't emphasize this enough, women, children, and those with disabilities and other vulnerable people, who you know most often than not are are left out of these conversations because it's such a technical discussion, but the impact. Uh, on these groups is is likely to be felt quite significantly. Yeah. So um, we need to put a human yeah. face to this conversation, and and I think it's it's very very important. Uh, so to close, um, I'd like to shift from debt to governance, if I may. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's been a call for more transparency, and not, not only, again, in sub-Saharan Africa, but across the globe. And everyone would agree that transparency has never been so important with, with all the fiscal support flowing into government coffers and, uh, and, and with the mounting debt. Uh, how do you ensure uh, transparency in spending and borrowing while not slowing any of these crucial support efforts down? in in sub-Saharan Africa? It's an important question. Um, And and it's one that has dominated 
the conversations i think since the the debt relief conversations have, have started and and for me it's you know organizations like like afro that um our job is to you know support and and hold accountable um governments based on their laws their legislations and their policies um and using all avenues to do that um and it starts with understanding what exactly is instituted um as law when it comes to issues around debt transparency debt accountability and debt governance you know we we have done work over the past 25 years in assessing the legal frameworks for uh loan contraction and debt management and they are quite weak and a lot of our advocacy has been to to strengthen the legislation and the policy framework um that that improves and enhances transparency that allows governments to be more accountable on how the debt is being used um you know whether it's through the national audit reports whether it is through the parliament that accountability really needs to be strengthened um the idea of governance and strengthening the governance there also requires institutions such as debt management office to be empowered to make policy recommendations to undertake critical scenario planning analysis on 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 the debt uh situation and to do debt diagnostics for for the countries um you know many sub saharan african countries don't necessarily have stand alone independent debt management offices they you know these tend to be directorates in the ministries of finance or in the national treasuries so you know their ability to steer away from the the, the politics of the day which we talked about at the beginning and of how important and, and how critical the politics is is something that you know we have been um and need to work on a, a lot more i think you know for me the the parallels that i draw on this transparency accountability and governance agenda which is very critical in also giving citizens a platform and an opportunity to understand what's going on when it comes to public debt is you know the 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 pathway that the revenue authorities took several years ago and also the central banks took where for many years um central banks and revenue authorities were part of a, a national treasury or a ministry of finance and then gradually you know the importance was was realized that these need to be independent objective institutions with their own legal mandate to perform their duties and and over time this has happened and i think you know this is a critical moment for for the debt movement to acknowledge that on the continent and in so doing then you know we have the opportunity to really enhance the transparency accountability and governance on on the continent on public debt matters um but i also want to say that this agenda should not be looked at in isolation and and sort of outside of the the realm of the global architecture um i've been very quick to remind my colleagues and my my peers and and friends that you know the the corruption the bribery the the bad governance the lack of transparency does not work in in a silo it works within an ecosystem and and the global financial and debt architecture does also suffer from really significant uh, lack of transparency um lack of accountability and lack of governance um and this is what you know we have been calling for for a very long time under the illicit financial flows the call for a global tax body you know just uh, recently the the UN's facti panel released its report on on financial accountability and transparency and within that it it is really calling for an overhaul of the global financial system because it is within that we we then have the seeds of of what we we are talking about at at the african level or around transparency accountability and governance so i think it's a two way system but um at the national level at the continental level it's ever more important now if we are going to be transformative out of this pandemic to really advance this is to get institutions that are independent that can really be have a mandate to to enhance this and then empower legislators uh and members of parliament to really hold governments account to how they're contracting their debt how they're spending it and also strengthen the, the voice of 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 the citizens um and this just means you know uh building their capacity uh making them understand how debt works within the broader financing architecture and empowering them to ask these questions and holding their governments account Jason Braganza, Executive Director of Afrodad, thanks so much for taking the time. Bruce, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure.
AfroDAD is the African Forum and Network for Debt Development. You can find out more about what they do at afrodad.org. You can watch a webcast of the opening session of the African Fiscal Forum at imf.org. And look for other IMF podcasts wherever you listen, and follow us on Twitter at IMF underscore podcast. Thanks for listening.